Hello, welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our 2022 Economic Outlook event. I'm Jude Kovitz, the managing partner of Matthews Carter and Boyce. MCB has been hosting this event for eight years now, and we will be joined again with by Dr. Terry Clower, the, the esteemed renowned economist, and so we'll have him on the stage, so to speak, momentarily. Um, 2022 has started with some challenges, uh, the Omicron variant in particular, but businesses by and large continue to stay open. They continue to adapt to these challenges and Dr. Clara will be informing us further about how that's all happening. Um, 2022 is also a very special year for MCB. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary. We're marking that milestone in creative ways to be able to stay connected with our community. Today is the first event to do so. Uh, as the year plays out, continue to stay connected with us, stay in touch. We'll be in touch with you to be able to share information with you as to events that we're going to be uh, hosting as the year plays out. So um, look forward to that. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, let me go through a few housekeeping items with you. We've modified the event this year just slightly. It's a 90 minute event with Dr. Clower's presentation followed by a Q&A. You can submit your questions in the Q&A function within Zoom. Uh, one of our partners, Cindy Park, will be heading up and leading the Q&A function. After, after the Q&A is done, we will then have a um, an event, a networking event for about 20 minutes with Dr. Clower. So stay on for that. You'll be put on camera at that time and please stay engaged for that. Uh, a week or two later, we'll be sending out an email that will provide you a link that will give you a summary of today's presentation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let me introduce our, our um, speaker, Dr. Clower. Dr. Clower is the Northern Virginia Chair and Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University. In addition, he's also the Director of GMU's Center for Regional Analysis. Dr. Clower today will be sharing his, his insights on the economy as it relates to Fairfax County, the DC region, and the nation as a whole. So Dr. Clower, thank you once again for joining us and um, it's all you, thank you. Thank you, Jude, appreciate that very much. And just give me a heads up that sounds good. Is the mic volume all right? Is the volume working? Uh, Jude, can it you- It sounds start? fine. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so let's get into this, folks. We're gonna cover a lot of material today, so I'll be going through very quickly. Uh, with our format today, as Jude mentioned, if you'll put your questions in the Q&A, we'll address them at the end. We'll look forward to next year when hopefully we are past uh, whatever the uh, Omega variant of this uh, bloody disease is, and we can be in person again and, and have more of our interactive session. But certainly, uh, please feel free to join us for the little session after we're done with the formal presentation, and we'll have some of our usual back and forth in that session. As we move through, I'm gonna be starting with the US economy, and then we'll move on to more regional and local events. So you've, you've seen the numbers, if you will. We had the obviously the huge, uh, in fact, a over 30% drop in GDP uh, as the nation went into shutdown. We have recovered. In fact, the technical recession lasted for about a month, uh, and then we started bouncing back. And as you can see, we have grown and, and notably, we are actually now and this year in about after the uh, first quarter, we grew to the point where we reached back all of what we had lost during the, uh, during the height of the pandemic shutdown. However, of course, we still haven't gone back to what we could think of as that trend line, as you can see here, we're still, you know, below probably what we should be. And I expect it to be a little bit longer before we get to that, but not too much. I think we will, you know, much will depend on what winds up happening this year. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But as you can see, growth has been a pretty robust third quarter estimates um, for 2021 show growth at about 4.7%. So that's that's uh, 
that is a, you know, a good recovery growth rate without getting too, too fast, if you will. Payroll jobs, of course, is in, have increased, but as we'll talk about through many aspects of this, that has been still a real drop, if you will. We certainly saw millions of jobs lost uh, at the height of the pandemic, but we are, and while we have been growing fairly dramatically, uh, growing back, we are still about three and a half million jobs short of where we were in February of 2020. So this is showing obviously some, even though the economy is growing, we still have a, a good bit of displacement and we're gonna talk about that more in just a moment. One of the things that has been interesting has been the degree to which economists like myself and others can't seem to hit the mark on the month to month job growth, you know, and so while uh, the November to December number showed, you know, December job growth at about 200,000, just under 200,000. And of course, remember, that's an that's an estimate that will likely be revised. It still was disappointing. We were expecting, you know, well above 300,000 and some were even predicting 400,000 jobs. I think what we saw in part was a little bit of a pause. It may have had somewhat to do with timing of holiday sales, may have had something to do with, obviously, with the uh, resurgence of the Omicron variant, uh, which we've been experiencing really started. If you think about it, it seems like it's been going on for a while, but Omicron didn't show up and, you know, seriously until about November. So that probably had something to do with that as we were starting to see declines in levels of activity, particularly shopping, uh, in, in person shopping, if you will, leisure, hospitality, those kind of events. Let's talk about the unemployment rates for just a moment. Uh, December rates down around 3.9%. As I have told this group before, I've been doing this long enough that I remember and even remember in, in school when 5% was considered structural unemployment. And but we have seen the unemployment rate coming down. That means that folks that are looking for jobs are generally finding them. Um, it's it looks you know it looks really like that trend has come down. It's not obviously as low as it was before the pre recession, but moving in the right direction. The other is that gap between the dark green and the lighter green in the in the top chart, which is the difference in the U6 and the headline unemployment rate. The U6 rate takes into account folks who are not employed full time, but would like to be. That's a generalized definition. But if you think about it, folks who have part time jobs that would rather be working full time, and you could think of that might be in folks in uh, obviously working in restaurants and things like that at this point for in some places and, and elsewhere. That gap had widened a good bit toward the end of uh, year before last in 2020, but we've been seeing, if you will, you notice that that gap between those two numbers are narrowing somewhat again. The really big story, and this is on everybody's mind, is that lower chart of the labor force participation rate. We saw it come down a lot, and what we are seeing now is that we have kind of flattened out and we're not seeing as much recovery in people coming back. This is part of what we've now started to call the uh, great resignation. And indeed, if you think about it, what we've really seen come out of this in many respects is that childcare has now become a national economic issue. Oh, and by the way, there's nothing new about that. I may have shared with you folks in previous sessions and previous years, I had an interesting conversation not too long after I moved to the DC area with a couple of gentlemen that run the National Association of School Superintendents. According to them, there is no pedagogical reason for kids to be in a physical school building more than about four hours a day. So if we think about it that way, we could almost say that half of the school day has as much to do with, with childcare so that parents can be at work as opposed to just a pure education function. Now, I'm not trying to make too much of that, but what we're seeing is that you've got issues of 
people not being able to return to work. And this is disproportionately, of course, have affected our women workforce. Um, but we are just seeing where it's, it's very hard. And of course, the other thing, many of you have probably experienced it, that you got your kid back in school. One of their classmates had, you know, sneezed three or four times and everybody was sent home for a few days. Fortunately, it seems like that kind of thing is backing up a little bit. The other thing are there are folks who are still afraid to return to work. Uh, there is some of this that honestly is probably because of the supplemental insurance, uh, unemployment insurance programs, and even the extended child uh, tax credit um, that we were seeing that, of course, both of those programs are the uh, supplemental unemployment insurance ended a few months ago, the child uh, the child tax credit supplement is uh, expiring shortly. Uh, the other thing, though, that could have something to do with it is the wealth effect that we've seen. You know, one of the outcomes of what's been happening in the stock market is that there are a lot of folks that have done very well, and maybe they've just got to the point where they're figuring, to heck with it, I've got enough, I can, I can get by. So we're going to have to see. But what I would tell you is that this is a, a significant problem and this labor force participation rate, your ability as business operators or your inability to find all of the workers you need at this point will and is having a dragging effect on growth. And indeed it is impacting my outlook for growth for next year and even beyond as we are seeking to find a new balance in our labor market. By the way, just as an interesting little aside, I heard something the other day on the radio. I have not found the data source myself, but it was, it was cited on the radio. The payroll protection program, they're now estimating that 34% of those funds went to actual employees with the remainder going to business owners or stockholders. Now, I'd love to see how they calculated that, but it, it's still one of those that that is an, an interesting outtake from uh, one of the premier, of course, job protection programs that we had during the height of the pandemic. So let's take a look at, at the US by sector. And I've made this slide a lot more complicated uh, than what it usually is, but what you see in the little red boxes is, though we've seen gains in all sectors except for federal government, and that's related to the census uh, having happened last year when they hired lots of temporary people, but the, what you see in those little red boxes is how employment compares now to employment in February of 2020, the month before we really saw the major impact in this country from COVID-19. So while education and health services, and that's private education and all sorts of health services has added 550,000 jobs in the last year, it's still down 716,000. Uh, professional and business services is much closer to having recovered, but look at leisure and hospitality. So getting close to 2.6 million jobs added in the last year, but still 1.2 million below what it was pre-pandemic. And you can just kind of look through that. Interestingly, there are only three sectors that actually have higher employment levels than what we saw before. And some of that is just an art. So the federal government down there in Bar, that was just an artifact of the way we counted that because of the, the hiring surge during the census period. But let's focus more importantly on financial services, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and of course, then transportation utilities, which doesn't really surprise anyone when you think about that. Once we stopped traveling for leisure and business, but particularly for leisure, what did we do? We started buying left and right and started buying anything we could find. And so there you have your, you know, the amount of trade that we have coming in, or at least trying to come in. Last time I, I saw the number, there was about 100 ships waiting at anchor off of the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles trying to get in to unload their cargoes. But the point is that transportation has seen dramatic employment increases um, and 
actually has performed better. And in fact, one of the biggest job shortages as we have in this nation is, of course, truck drivers at the moment. And you've heard that from many, from many sources. The finance sector is interesting because I'm trying to figure out exactly where that is within the finance sector. But I suspect that a good part of that may be in some of these newer alternative kind of financial corporations as opposed to the usual suspects, if we will. I'm thinking about Sophie and things and companies like that. But nonetheless, we are growing. Growth has been pretty good, but we still have a ways to go to get to recovery. Weekly earnings, certainly you have all started to see it in your own businesses, I would suspect, that, that wages are rising. You see that little bump there that occurred about the time that the pandemic hit? That's an artifact of the way the pandemic affected affected businesses and employment. That wasn't that people started earning more. It was just that there were a lot more jobs that were lost in relatively low paying sectors of the economy, retail, hospitality, leisure. And that caused the average wages to go up because simply the jobs that were lost were at the bottom end. But you'll notice that that slope has has gone up, you know, and we've seen a little bit of an uptick in the long term trend, if you will. The slope of the line is just a little steeper. Having said that, we look at that bottom end and that's our inflation adjusted. And because of what inflation has been doing, we've actually lost almost two percent in real earnings power, even with those wage increases. And of course, what this suggests is that that there will be, you know, we're almost going to have to be careful about that cycle of people are going to demand higher wages if they're paying more money at the grocery store. And yet, if you start having higher wages, well, those have to be reflected in prices at some point. So it's a real tricky balance. And I certainly do not envy the Fed as they're trying to navigate that. And we're going to talk about that more in just a little bit. Here's another thing, since we're talking about labor markets, there's a couple of other points that I, I want to bring up. First of all, the claims, of, and I didn't mention this before, but on, in new claims for unemployment insurance, we're back down into the into the ranges a little above 200,000, something like that. And that's very much what we saw pre-pandemic. So that number seems to, at least at the moment, have returned more to a normal. But let's take a look at one of the interesting things. So here's a data series that, that we've been following. It's a question that the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts in there and, and asks for the Census Bureau to do in the current population survey that's run every month. Note that the question is specifically about the coronavirus pandemic. So this would not technically include anybody that was working at home just because they didn't want to work in the office and their bosses said, fine, you know, that's specifically the response is that. But if you look at that, obviously we had peaks in the workforce around 35% in May of 2020 when they started doing this survey. And you'll notice that we've kind of worked down, you know, we, you, you can see the Delta variant kind of come in a little bit in some respects there toward the end, but we've leveled off and it hasn't gained a whole lot more. Um, but we have seen fewer, so 175,000 fewer between November and December, so dropping slightly, but it seems to really kind of have leveled out a little bit. And one of the things that will be interesting is that it didn't show up a whole lot in December, but as we continue to battle through this Omicron variant and of course all of the hospitalization rates that we're seeing across the country, I, I would not be surprised to see that number tick up a little bit more about that than that. And we'll certainly do that. But this, this is, again, this is just about the pandemic. I think the more interesting thing that we will talk about more and it'd be certainly interested to hear what you guys have when we have our interactive session uh, today is remote work. So this is some data from a company called Ladders. Uh, that's uh, I've shown the source there. You can look this up. And they do a survey, a national survey of companies, employers, and they're specifically looking at high paying jobs. So 100,000 plus salaries. And what they're looking at is, uh, is whether or not those employers are allowing remote work now. That appears that their definition 
is completely remote. So this is not the hybrid of you go to the office two or three days a week. This is completely remote. You may go to the office, you know, once a month or a couple of times a year or something or another. So truly remote work. So prior to the pandemic, it wasn't unheard of, about 4% of workers, and you can think of those, and you particularly think in terms of certain types of sales occupations, and then some engineers and things, we'll talk about that in just a moment. By the end of 2020, that had gone up to 9%. End of 2021, their number, most recent number is 18%. So what they claim, and I thought this was interesting, and it's just here, in the fourth quarter of 2021, 3 million more high paying jobs moved to being remote. And there are now over 20 million of those jobs in the marketplace, according to using their survey data. Now, of course, you know, it's always, you know, who responded to their survey and all of that, but it seems to be broad enough. It's interesting to me that what we're coming to the conclusion is remote work is being used to help deal with talent availability issues. Uh, it spreads out your effective labor shed, but the other is it's some attitudinal stuff. It's a quality of life, work, you know, life and workload balance and all of those kind of things. And the fact of the matter is, is despite what <clears throat> Jamie Dimon and some other folks would do about, you know, you know, saying, oh, everybody's got to come back to the, the, uh, the office. I think those days are pretty much done. Now, there will be some balance that will come out of it, but I don't see in a tight labor market how any company is going to be able to dictate that when somebody, somebody else in the marketplace will say, hey, come to work for us and we'll let you work remotely. So what we see then the occupations, engineering, account executives, like I say, you know, design work, sales work, the kind of things that you do things where you collaborate some and you can collaborate more and more effectively, just like we're gonna be doing today in sessions uh, online. Maybe it's not as good as everything else, but you can find ways of making it work. But if a lot of your job is just you having to think, you designing, or it's outside the office where your activity is engaged with others, then there's no, there's no real reason not to have the remote work. I want to bring up labor productivity for just a moment, just because we've seen a drop here recently, if you'll see that that latest number, that's third quarter number. I think that's a little bit transitory, but partly what we're seeing is the drop in productivity reflecting job gains in the broader economy. We've seen some uptick in employments. And of course, and what, what happens a lot of times is that, you know, as you're rebalancing and your output and your sales and all this, we're figuring out ways to do, but we're really pressing people. In fact, if you look at the broader surveys and you guys may feel this yourself, since we've moved to a lot of online work, a lot of us feel like we're actually working more not just a matter of the, the regained commuting time, but our days seem to be longer. And that seems to be pretty much prior. And maybe this is what's showing up in, in some of the productivity. We will be more productive in terms of labor input per unit of output. And that's going to drive economic growth in a long time. Our productivity, our ability to, uh, to create disseminate and adopt technologies like we are seeing now, like Zoom, is one of the things that helps drive the US economy and makes us competitive in the world. Some of our productivity gains uh, over the next several years are gonna come from technology supplanting labor. And some of that's gonna be market driven. So for example, the more we see $15 an hour minimum wage, the fewer humans will be engaged with at fast food restaurants. We're already seeing it. You know, If you go into McDonald's, you know, a lot of them now use the kiosk or use the, the counter and talk to a person. It, the higher we make those minimum wage jobs, the fewer of those counter people will, you'll have and the more kiosks that you'll see. On a different scale, and actually a much bigger challenge for us in overall economic growth in the longer term will be the expanded application of artificial intelligence and machine learning into lower level white collar occupations. I mean, we are, we're seeing, I'm talking about clerical work. If your job is simply moving paperwork from one side of your desk to another side of your desk, 
I cannot see where you can expect to be doing that job in another five to seven years. We already have law firms now that use artificial intelligence algorithms to draft legal briefs. Of course, attorneys review it then, but if you think about it, the, low, the lower level clerk who would have used to do that is now in some firms being displaced by technology. What we have to do then is get folks ready for that change. We have to have intentional programs of incumbent worker retraining moving forward, if unless we want to have a massive labor disruption over just a few year period as companies start adopting those kind of technologies. Let's shifting in a little bit to talk about consumer confidence. <laughs> Folks, I tell you what, this chart in some ways, as much as any other, tells us a lot about consumer behavior in the U.S. So you'll see that the expectations, how we think the economy is going to be about six months out. It, it's really interesting that it's, it's bounced up and down some, but it's kind of stayed pretty stable even throughout the, uh, the pandemic. So in other words, there was you know, there, yes, there was a little downtick, if you can see there just past 2020, where that green line kind of, you know, ticked down a little bit, but it wasn't a massive drop off. We saw the massive drop off in the present situation where what's happening now. So that meant that folks on average that respond to this survey were saying that, hey, this is hurting me now, but it's not going to hurt us in the long run, which of course then helps to explain why folks, even with the disruptions in the economy, just opened up the wallets and bought everything they could. Home remodeling, mass, you know, massive expenditures on, on capital goods, if you will, for the home. In other words, you know, doing, you know, adding, a, you know, buying new stuff. You know, it's why Amazon shows up at your, your house three or four times a day, or at least that's what it seems like happens at my house some. So it's really kind of interesting moving forward. But if you'll notice that we had that, you know, what we saw going in to 2021 was we really thought we were coming out of it and everybody was feeling pretty good. And then, of course, we had the Delta variant that hit and that ticked it down somewhat, but didn't bring it down. So, you know, some of it also, quite frankly, is um, I, I haven't heard this particular term used, but I'm sure somebody has, you know, the pandemic fatigue. You know, there are a lot of us that are just kind of over it and we're going to not be unsafe, but we're just kind of getting on with life. But as you can see, that high levels of existing consumer confidence is helping to drive spending and helping to drive uh, even investments because it's, it's affecting how much money people are willing to put in the markets. We're going to look at some of that a little bit later in different versions. So prices, uh, obviously inflation has become the economic and political news story of 2021. And quite frankly, it will be the story of 22. Prices are up. Though it's not even, our highest increases have been in auto fuels, um, used cars, groceries. I mean, the used cars, we can kind of think because there's not as many new cars because of the disruptions in chip supplies and we keep seeing pullbacks. Mercedes, for example, isn't building any of their low end cars at the moment. It's just all luxury cars because they have supply chain constraints on the on some of their components and so they're building those vehicles that are the highest profitability and of course because of the consumer confidence there's lots of demand for those kind of vehicles auto fuels is being driven by oil prices and oil prices is kind of interesting but i want you to understand something about the oil market as it were we had been riding on a really good wave of low oil prices that came about in say 2011, 12, and 13, and really hit in 2014, that was because of the shifting technology in oil production to hydraulic fracturing. So fracking, when it was developed, was very much about breaking up shell formations to extract natural gas. They figured out a way to make it work for oil, and so that is when the U.S. 
became basically a net exporter of oil. Now, don't get me wrong. We still are importing a lot of oil because our refineries are very much designed to handle the very heavy Middle Eastern crudes, whereas what we produce in this country in terms of the raw material is the West Texas Intermediate, a lighter version. And so we're exporting that elsewhere. We're using some of it. But what happened is that we had a massive fall off in prices. And we've just seen them gradually rise back up as a kind of as the supply chain, the, the balance of supply and demand has recalibrated itself. So we had an extended period of time since 2014 of substantially low energy prices, including transportation fuels. Now we had, of course, last you remember we talked a little bit about. I think last year that in 2020, there actually was a period of time, there was a day in the spot market where oil had negative value because the supply, the storage tanks were full. You had tankers, which remember a, a tanker, a super tanker takes about 60 days to get from the Middle East to the refineries in the Gulf of Mexico. So you had this cargo that was out there and they had no place to unload it. And a the last time I looked, a super tanker was somewhere north of $100,000 a day in base lease plus operating costs. So they were looking to get rid of this and willing to actually pay. There were a few sellers willing to pay people to take oil off their hands, which is a really interesting phenomenon. But we've seen that demand curve, of course, as we started traveling in, we're actually driving more and more people taking driving vacations and even flying, even though the flying is, has come back a lot. So it's just what we're seeing is that oil prices have really risen, and I think they will continue. I think uh, we're now above uh, West Texas Intermediate is above eighty dollars, and there are some that are st they're talking again about hundred dollars a barrel. Mind you, I have been through that before. I remember the mid '80s when it was going to hit hundred dollars. So it seems to be a real price point in there where we have some uh, take the other the, we have some resistance, if you will. The other thing, that, of course, that is that's driving the the oil prices at the moment is instability in the Middle East. You have the Yemeni um, rebels are now shooting off uh, rockets or are using drones to attack infrastructure in the UAE, and that's causing some um, some. Uh, real consternation over there. That may be the market traders excuse of the day to drive up prices. I don't know. But in any case, what we're seeing is still, despite price rises, we are seeing demands for uh, luxury items, uh, boats, fancy cars. We continue to see the, the supply chain constraints, computer chips that we talked about momentarily, uh, China's COVID strategies course, are shutting down certain supply chains where they just shut things down when there's very few, of course, the transportation snarls that I talked about a little bit earlier. We are going to see inflation remain comparatively high throughout 2022 because consumers haven't seen all of the price rises yet. So let me, to illustrate that point, let's look for a moment at the difference between consumer prices and producer prices. So the lighter green line is the consumer price index. The darker green is the producer price index. And you'll see that while those have tracked generally pretty closely with the other, we have a separation going on now. And what we are seeing is that in some of that, we have businesses that are absorbing a part of that price increase that they're having into producer prices. But Trust me, that's going to have to flow through. So that would tell me that inflation is going to stay elevated well into next year as those producer prices start hitting then into the consumption area. This is going to make the Fed's job of knowing how hard to tap the brakes even harder. The first couple of rate increases that the Fed does in this year in 2022, I think are going to have really little noticeable effect on CPI because of this lag effect that we're seeing starting to build here. And the question will be, does that cause them to push harder or do they wait? Now, aside, since we're in the DC area and we can talk about polit politics just a little bit, I will tell you that if the CPI is still, is still showing 
numbers in the five and six percent or above range by summertime, the Democrats are going to be in full panic because right at the moment, the narrative that has been crafted is that the Biden policies are somehow to blame for these. Of course, we know that that's probably not true in the large extent. There might be a little bit of it, certainly, but I think it's it's uh, I, I think it's it's going to be one that there will be a lot of pressure on the Fed. And what we don't want them to do, of course, is to push too hard on the brakes and actually cause us to go into recession. Let's move in and talk about housing for a couple of minutes. So the story of housing is inventory, and that's going to continue. What we've seen in terms of U.S. and home sales, both in terms of the uh, existing home sales, which is that orange line, is very much about drops in inventory. We saw the effect of the pandemic during the shutdown and the massive spring back, and that was a little bit of surge back. And some of that was about people, you know, changing locations, moving from a one-bedroom, you know, apartment into a home, so that a couple can both be working from home, that kind of thing. But what we've seen is that um, that inventories have been dropping a good bit, even though we have still seen reasonably high levels of sale. The new home sales are being impacted in part because of, of uh, supply chain constraints and, you know, and then inflation in building materials. I remember, and I don't think we talked about this last time, but there were new stories coming out of people who were buying luxury homes who were signing contracts where the builder is saying, I cannot guarantee you when I'm going to have your home finished, and I cannot guarantee you how much it's going to cost at the end. You know, and so let's face it, we can use that as our definition of being wealthy now. If you can buy a luxury home and you don't care when it gets done and you don't care how much it's going to cost, uh, that will be our new definition of wealth. The National Association of Realtors is expecting mortgage rates to be around 3.6% uh, next year. Uh, I think it could tick up a little bit higher than that, but I definitely think that we're going to stay at or below 4% on mortgage rates. Now, compared to what we've been seeing recently, that's going to seem high. And certainly that differential of 100 basis points or more increase is going to push maybe some folks out of the market. Uh, but... I will tell you that that as you as those of you that are old enough know, a four percent mortgage rate is still pretty good by historic standards. So I would expect that we're going to see continued movement and continued strong home sales, probably not as big as in 2021. And we'll look at more at that locally in just a couple of moments. But as we're moving through this, I, I just want you to to get that sense that home sales are going to be good and we are going to continue we are going to see mortgage rates rise as interest rates go up however there's also going to be pressures that are going to be keeping some of that lending down because quite frankly the housing market is still on a the US housing market is an attractive place to have your money from any global financial perspective. In other words, we're gonna see folks still willing to buy packages of mortgages. Uh, and of course, and Freddie and Fannie are gonna keep doing what they do. Now, what goes along with that though, is something that is emerging as a real challenge in our markets, particularly where housing markets are very tight on a continuing basis, not just places where they're tight this year or this last year because of, of all this demand of activity, but like in DC, Austin and other areas is the amount of homes that are basically being taken off the ownership market because they're being purchased by investor groups. Now I'm a free market person. However, uh, Mark Zandi came out with some numbers recently saying that by his estimates in 2021, 26% of all home sales in this nation were to landlords, not to homeowners. So if home ownership is our pathway to multi-generational wealth building and things like that, uh, that we've assumed to be, we can argue whether that is true or not, but we can just say that that is the way our policies in this country are set. If we have this external constraint that basically where you have folks buying up homes, I have to wonder how that's going to impact our ability to retain talented workers. If you have millennials 
and of course be soon the uh, Gen Zers who are wanting to buy a home and they're finding no homes available because there's only rental properties available, will they leave to go to other areas? So our challenge is to balance out that public policy of having homes available for ownership with not interfering with the market too much. And that's an interesting balance. I'd be happy to, to, to uh, chat with that with uh, some of you folks later about that one. So let's look at the US outlook then. The Fed is going to have to respond to inflation, and they're going to do that both by pulling back on asset purchases, which has already uh, started to happen some, but I think that will accelerate. Uh, they are going to increase rates. I'm expecting three. I know there are some uh, forecasters now saying four rate increases this coming year. I'm sticking with the notion of three before year end. The demand curve is still shifting upwards uh, that will support higher prices. And this is across all stages of goods, both raw materials, the intermediate goods that are used in manufacturing processes, and then of course, finished goods. The supply chain backups, I think are going to unwind. I was originally thinking it would be sometime before the end of the second quarter, but it looks to me like, particularly with what's going on in China now, uh, that it's gonna be somewhere in the third to fourth quarter, and that during this period of time, we're gonna see transportation prices still high. The cost of shipping a container from Europe uh, is about four times higher than what it was before the, the pandemic. Now, we've seen actually a little softening of that uh, here in the last month or so, but it's still gonna be, transportation costs and the supply chain backups are going to continue. Consumer spending uh, for those that have money is going to stay strong. I think that, you know, boat sales and things like that are still going to be a very good year. I don't know if it'll be as good as 2021, but it's going to be a good year. Stock markets are good, but I think we're going to see some volatility there's a lot of concern that I've heard in the market, particularly about tech company stock prices, um, particularly those that haven't bothered with actually making a profit yet, or even the ones that haven't even had really much of a revenue stream yet that keep seeing money flow in. Because one of the things about people having extra money, they've used some of that money to invest. And that's driven the stock market. Maybe things have gotten a little bit of front. We've seen some pullbacks here recently. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I expect the market to go up for the year. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a bad year, but I do think that there's going to you're going to have to ride through some volatility. Uh, the Build Back Better program that would have been a, even another bigger round of, of stimulus uh, coming out of the federal government will either be much smaller or non-existent. Right now, I think the odds makers would have to say non-existent seems to be more of the term, but we might get a little bit out of it. The infrastructure spending, of course, is, is been passed and is, and is good, but that's going to happen over seven years or more. So it, it's not like it's going to be in a major surge for us. Labor markets are going to be tight, especially for skilled workers. Uh, we will see some job hopping. Um, and basically, this is going to be until basically managers kind of get a grip on the idea who's in charge now. And right now, it's the workers that are having the say instead of, instead of the employers. So let's look at some, then just some bottom, again, as I said, three um, 25 basis point increases. I think inflation, if we are successful at doing this, we're going to see about 4% for next year. That's still elevated above Fed targets, but I think we're going to be hard pressed to get it down much below that without putting the economy at risk. Uh, the stock markets, as said, modestly. So my forecast for GDP at the moment is 3.8%. Of course, there are some big ifs, and those big ifs are if we can continue a transition to endemic from pandemic, meaning that we're, you know, that whatever new variant that we learn how to live with better, we learn how to conduct business, we learn how to get on with our lives, maybe with some adaptive changes as we keep seeing this, this, um, this virus um, mutate. I'm seeing now where uh, one of the countries uh, was in Australia that just came out and said, that they're now recommending boosters, you know, three months or something, you know, a shorter period of time. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. And the other, of course, is the political in instability of what, you know, of basically Vladimir Putin trying to test Biden to see, you know, if he would, you know, he didn't test Trump a whole lot because he, he he was afraid Trump might get crazy on him, you know, but, but um, uh, you know, 
the image that we have portrayed of Biden as being somewhat soft. So it's going to be real interesting to see. And, and that could have some deleterious effects on markets all over the place, could really drive energy prices up, et cetera. So I'm hopeful that there will be a diplomatic solution to that. Um, let's move now to the Washington economy. So in this market, what we've seen is obviously that, that major drop off. Uh, we can see um, that pattern of growth as we've recovered, but we're still along, we're still a good bit of ways from where we were pre uh, recession. Uh, we had some really uh, substantial growth. But of course, as you might expect, some of that growth hasn't been, um, some of that growth hasn't been as robust as we would like. And quite frankly, I think that very much has to do with, of course, labor market shortages. We have, oh gosh, uh, something in order. I mean, it's in the, the last number I saw was well over 16,000 technology sector jobs that are, that could be filled, you know, I mean, as people, as, as fast as companies could on, onboard them. And that's been actually going on for a while. If I split this out just a little bit, uh, we're going to look. The uh, green here is uh, the District of Columbia, orange is uh, Southern Maryland, and blue is Northern Virginia. And as you look at those, you can see some differentials in performance. Um, the DC has not been recovering as fast. That has something to do with leisure and, and hospitality, of course, and tourism uh, and business travel, of course. Uh, Maryland, uh, in, when it started recovering, was doing pretty well there for a couple of three months, but they've slowed substantially. And Northern Virginia is a little bit slower, but has been doing pretty well. As we move through this, just as a reminder, here's, our, here's the structure of our economy. So professional business services, which is a very broad sector, we'll talk more about in just a moment, at about 23, or I'm sorry, 24%. Uh, that's actually up from about 23% pandemic. Uh, education, health services, 13. You can see on down leisure and hospitality at 8.5. Just to give you a sense, leisure and hospitality used to be the fourth highest and represented about 10 and a half percent. So it's been a, a notable shift in that and retail came around for them. Uh, federal government pre-pandemic was 10.9%. Now it's 11.4. That's a little bit of that stabilizing force that um, Judd was mentioning when we first got started. So this is, and you know, that underpinning that we've talked about, I would rough guess at the moment that the federal sector, both in terms of government spending as well as direct government employment, has gone up from about 32, 33% of the regional economy to probably closer to 35%, something like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's ticked up a little bit uh, in the pandemic, but certainly not overtaking anything and not as high as it was, say, in 2010 when that number was closer to 40%. So again, uh, a complicated slide with a lot of information on it that we can see how we're doing. Uh, but interestingly enough, we are net ahead of the game in, in professional business services. We are ahead of, the, of where we were in uh, 2020 in education health services, uh, you know, but we are still down about 44,000 in leisure and hospitality. Uh, you can look and see there throughout the rest of this slide. Interestingly, note that there's been a notable drop in financial services, and this is counter to what's been happening at the national level. I think some of that, quite frankly, is a result of some local mergers that we've been seeing. Uh, some of them occurred before the pandemic, and it's just now that we're seeing you know, the, the re results of that. The other is, quite frankly, if you're working as a clerk in a branch bank, I would start thinking about what's going to be the next career because we're going to see more and more branch banks. We started to see them shut down, uh, and some of that's been because of COVID restrictions, but I think some of it's going to be just that we do more of it electronically. We can do our deposits over our phone. We, you know, we just have less need of walk-in banking locations. So I think that number is likely to continue to, to go down. And the other sectors you can look at, and certainly this um, 
these data will be available on the MCB website uh, later if you want to come back and look to it or to our website at CRA. Focusing a little more on professional business services, since it's our, our top factor, our top uh, industry. I think it's interesting, you know, we seeing that we're up about 31,000 jobs year over year. This number is for November, which is the most recent we have for local data. Uh, always a little bit longer data lag that we have, but uh, for the local data, but still uh, fairly impressive growth. But I want to unpack this a little bit as I've taken to do. If we look at this in two separate pieces, one is professional sectors, and these are things like engineers, accountants, lawyers, computer programmers, things like that, versus administrative support and waste management, which is people who clean buildings, uh, people who work at temporary employment agencies, the folks that are, are uh, doing building security, things like that. Those were the sectors, the more in-person kind of sectors that obviously took the big hits. Professional and business had a little bit of mixed bag throughout the region on that and you can kind of see where and then where we've now had some recovery in that in both of those sectors but the really hard hit sector was actually the lower wage lower value added sector that part of that what has now become known as the k-shaped recession that we had due to this um, the folks that lost their jobs were not the folks that are likely to be going to work in a maserati or something and but i do want to point out something here that's just really interesting Let's look at just Northern Virginia for just a moment. The thing that I want you to, to notice is that during the recession, there was not a single month or during any time during the pandemic where Northern Virginia did not have net new jobs added in their professional science and technology workforce really, really interesting about resilience. And some of that is about defense contracting. Some of it is about our movement in Northern Virginia, thanks to Amazon and others, Micron, where we have non-federal dependent growth going along with what's been happening with federal agencies and, and of course their spending. The federal government, of course, I. I still have to put this up just because it's such a big sector of the economy, uh, 375,000 workers at the moment. I expect that number to go up as more of the infrastructure spending programs come in. Somebody's going to be administrating it. And the good news is even if that infrastructure is being built elsewhere, we have contractors in this region that will get some of that money and will get to capture a little bit of the administrative spending on it, but uh, I would not expect this number to change dramatically, but it's not going to drop as what we would have seen maybe in the previous administration. Unemployment rates, uh, we're starting to see some divergence performance between Northern Virginia and DC and these other areas, but you'll notice that, um, that interestingly, uh, we have Northern Virginia is separating itself in this measure from our other sub regional areas. It's and what's also interesting is that Southern Maryland and DC both and it's not unusual for DC, but for Southern Maryland to be trending higher than the US average really points to a challenge uh, that is worth exploring a little bit more. I think in something that we're going to be monitoring closely and certainly Montgomery County is very much aware that they've not been performing as well as they would like in terms of business attraction and retention. How are we comparing against others? Well, we were doing before the pandemic started, we were middle of the pack to the high side of the pack a little bit. Uh, we've fallen off of that a little bit. Uh, you're seeing some of the big boom areas over there. So interestingly, Los Angeles and Dallas, naturally we attribute the strength of Los Angeles to the fact that they now have two football teams. Uh, remember they went for quite a long time, a couple of, what was it, a couple of decades without any uh, professional football. So this obviously must be all about the NFL. Uh, and of course their team is still playing unlike the Dallas. And you'd say that it just means you have to get to the playoffs. Doesn't that mean that you have to play well or know how to manage the clock at the end of the game, obviously. Uh, but we can see where uh, uh, for us to be in this position, 
I think in some respects, it, we're just not hot. And I, what concerns me is our ability to bring new workers into this region. Population growth, every time I'm from Dallas, as most of you know, every time I go back and I was back in uh, September for some family business, it is just amazing at the rate of, of growth that we're seeing there. And of course, their, their real estate prices are still affordable, but going up dramatically because of demand. Just to look real quickly uh, at some of the individual data. So this is just giving you a quick look at what's been going on. Uh, as say the uh, recovery in the District of Columbia has not been as strong as others, and that is structural, uh, particularly in terms of leisure, hospitality, uh, even in terms of business travel. Because you think about it, lobbyists can't just walk into Congress buildings anymore. So it's it's spread across. It's not just tourists in that sense. Southern Maryland, as say they started out, they had those couple of three months of pretty good and then have leveled out. And then we saw the same trend a little bit in Northern Virginia, but balancing out at a higher level. And again, you see that that number is November, November, about 55,000. So uh, doing pretty well in Northern Virginia. I think it's worth talking about venture capital in just a moment and its effect on small, on particularly our small business sector here in the region. First of all, last year, we just rewrote every record there was out there in terms of venture capital. Uh, look at the number of deals. Two times as many deals as in 2020, year over year. So over 17,000 deals. Look at that number, Three, almost $330 billion uh, in venture capital in the US. And what's interesting is a piece of that, though, you had the non-traditional deals, in other words, not non-traditional sources, so not the old guard of venture capital doing over 6,000 deals and $250 billion up about 60% over the, the values in 2020. In our, our region, we, again, are just killing it last year compared to what we normally do, right? 415 deals, so over 100% increase, $5.7 billion, a 200, more than actually, it's a good bit over 200% increase year over year. I think that is, I think it is just an incredible, incredible number and speaks to a lot of money flowing in the system. But on the other hand, it makes me wonder has it gotten a bit frothy? And what I'm speaking to there is particularly the non-traditionals because I kind of wonder if we've got so much money flowing in now that some of that money is going into firms that probably don't need, you know, probably are not good deals. You know, are we, and are we having a bid up effect even in some cases? I'd be interested in, interested to hear from some of you that uh, play in this space on a daily basis, what you think about going on regionally. Oh, and by the way, even though we increased greatly, we picked up a little ground, but we are still nowhere near being among the big boys, if you will, in, in this market. So we still have a lot of work to do about changing the way we structure our economy. And indeed, I would invite you to keep an eye out on stuff that CRA in collaboration with Marymount University is gonna be doing in the next year. So we're really promoting the notion of shifting some of our entrepreneurial activities in this region to help really underwrite and really support businesses that are product-based businesses instead of service-based businesses. And that doesn't mean that the service-based businesses aren't valuable to us, and particularly in a government town and all that, but we want, we want companies who are producing products that are selling into the marketplace it's not just to the federal government, because those tend to be higher value added, bigger returns, more employees, et cetera, than what you get out of the service firms. Let's talk about real estate for just a couple of moments then. Um, inventory is the local. I, I mean, you look, look at that long-term trend since, the, since uh, 2014. <laughs> It is very much, you know, how low can you go? It, we're, we're playing the limbo in this. And, and now, fortunately, the inventory levels, you know, really dipped down, of course, as people pulled home the, off the market during the height of the of, uh, of recession, but then it dipped down even further. 
and you just look at it, we we're down, you know, a number of units. Now, having said all that, keep in mind this is a big market, and look at my uh, scale over there on the on the right hand y axis. There's still a number of markets, but compare that to what it was, you know, a few years ago, where you know we would regularly have. Um, peaks in the in the high part of season of over 30,000 homes in the marketplace. And now we're running, you know, substantially lower than that. So it, it just means that the markets are tight. This is why we have individual um, markets uh, around here where the time on market, you know, for a home is, ma is measured in hours, not days. Um, that's, that's, of course, unusual. But we are seeing, you know, this this whole notion about even at the broader average, we're we're getting below two two months of inventory out there. It's it's just really, really, really crazy. Um, but home sales keep going up. So how can that be? Well, two factors is that one, you know, is is that just means that the home is is sold very quickly. So the inventory data, as you as I presented uh, in the previous slide. That is a point in time at the end of the month. It doesn't, it just says how many are, you know, on this date, how many homes are on the market. It doesn't say how many homes are on the market over the course of the month. It's just the way the data get ca captured in the uh, MLS system. So it's a little bit of a misnomer in that sense. And that just means that when we continue to see sales, that means that the days on market is coming down. And of course, as you might expect, and economic still, you know, economic principles still matter, uh, prices would rise. The other piece that I'd get to you is that our permitting, while we saw a surge in permitting, it's really backed off a lot. And of course, and we've been running a little higher than that longer term trend, but we have got to get more homes built. That's all there is to it. We've got to figure out a way to, to increase the number of homes that are being built in this market to support population growth and to support folks from two perspectives. One is there's not that big a part of our population who retire and then go off to Florida or Georgia or the Carolinas or someplace or another. Most people are aging in place. They have other family, grandkids, whatever in the area. So they're sticking around and we have more people coming in although that has slowed down a good bit, our domestic uh, net out migration is still negative in some respects. We're a little bit delayed on getting some of the most recent data on that, which will still be about a year and a half old, but uh, we expect there to be doing that. And of course, international migration is still important to us, uh, though it's been suspended. Uh, it's been at lower levels and, and will be interesting to see as the Biden administration matures, if we actually start seeing more international migrants coming into the region. Uh, but still, we need to build some. Prices are, of course, going up because of these pressures. Now, the reason that the, and you'll note there at the end how the blue line, you have that little bit of a, of a higher spike that's been a part of this excessive, uh, this really strong demand that we've been seeing in 2021. 2021 turned out to be a really good year if you were in the business of supporting the transaction of, re, of uh, residential properties. I would expect that 2021 is going to be a very good year, but a little bit muted from compared to, uh, I'm sorry, 2022 is going to be a very good year versus, tw but 2021, not at those levels, I would expect moving forward. I think it's going to calm down a little bit. The reason we haven't seen sale prices that go even higher, though, has to do, of course, with qualifications of mortgages and all that. And that has been recently changed because, um, Freddie and Fannie now uh, conforming loan is now over uh, a change that was made late uh, last year is now over $900,000. I think it's like 922,000 and somebody in the audience may know that more specific, but that's a substantial increase in conforming loans. So we'll see that reflected in even more activity and probably some price pressures moving forward into 2022. Looking at the apartment markets, I think it's really kind of interesting. So rents, uh, this last year up about 15%, uh, now running uh, region-wide at about 253 a square foot. Um, that's higher than pre-pandemic. We actually saw uh, rents go down, uh, interestingly, largely driven by what was happening in uh, the District of Columbia. 
Vacancy rates are at 3.4%, which is uh, substantially less than the fourth quarter 2020 at 6.1%. Uh, we had about 10,600 units delivered this year, scheduled to have almost 15,000 units delivered next year. And the 36 month pipeline, uh, of course, is uh, approaching 40,000. I would think that all of those will happen, but the problem with even the deliveries for this coming year will be still somewhat issues about supply chain constraints on building materials. Uh, the 36 month pipeline, by the way, is actually down uh, about, if I'm remembering right, about four or 5% of what we saw last year. So, so we definitely want to see some of that shift. The class B uh, is over there and just note that the, the units are the same. Um, Interestingly enough, though, the units under renovation is substantially less than what it was, say, a couple of years ago. Uh, so I very much, you know, we're going to be talking, I think, about that a little bit more in just a little bit. We can have some discussion about the notion of renovations. Office vacancies. So those of you in the commercial, well, um, unfortunately, uh, my source did not release the fourth quarter office data yet. Um, but if we look at this trend, the long run trend in um, direct office and vacancy rate for our region has been rising and, and pretty steadily uh, over the last few years. We've seen properties come on the market and some of this is your kind of your difference. Um, I think a large part of what we're seeing now and the reason it hasn't accelerated given some of the, the work from home data that we'll talk about in just a moment, um, office tenants just haven't given up their leashes yet because they're unsure. Why, you know, and, and of course, you don't, there's the financial distances of trying to break a lease. So I think some of this is reflective and the reason that this number hasn't gone higher is just simply that companies are waiting to see what's going on. Uh, companies who own their properties will be the ones most reluctant to move to hybrid workforce. They're going to try to keep their workers coming in because what business, what you know, executive wants to be the one to have to take a big write off on on a company asset like that, right? They don't want to take that accounting charge. Um, and of course, those kind of factors don't affect, you know, the tech firms, particularly, you know, and tech firms and Elon Musk own firms where, you know, he does a tweet and people are sending him another billion dollars worth of worth of money. Uh, but I think we are seeing an increase. and I think it's going to continue as we see the shift into hybrid. Anecdotally, we have been seeing some professional firms in this region move further out. Uh, from the from the district and into smaller spaces with some of those being uh, that I've seen around 40% drops. So it's been a substantial decline in some of them. Uh, and of course, and, and fair enough, if you have folks come into the office three times a week, you know, what space are you going to try to do? Are you going to balance it out to where you can reduce your total space? Because do you want to keep paying the utility? utilities going if your average space utilization is 40% of what it was. So I think it's going to get really interesting as this coming year unfolds and we figure out how to do this. And to track this, there's a piece of data that we started tracking at a project that we were doing for WMATA on transit ridership um, this last year. Castle Systems is a security company. Some of you may be familiar with them and they have their fobs or whatever used for uh, people coming in. This is their index of buildings that Castle has contracts for doing the security on and are unique building industries. In other words, you know, because entries, they're the um, particular assigned to an individual. The baseline that this compares against was the average of the first and second weeks of February of 2020. And as you can see, it dipped down dramatically, of course, you know, less than 20, but we still are, we are still below 40% return. And of course we had the downtick. I'm going to blame that, you know, the, the Christmas week and the week after Christmas is that, that dip we saw down there are people returning to the office, most recent data they had posted. But if you look at that, we've been slow to come back. Now, if we unpack this a little bit, the number is actually even a little worse on average for DC, a lower return with the exception of law firms. 
law firms across the board are closer to that 40% now. And we think some of that may be the, you know, just the nature of the work and management of files and, you know, paper records and things like that may be causing some of that. I wonder how, how much of that is law clerks and secretaries versus the lawyers themselves. That'd be an interesting thing, but this is real interesting data. The, and by the way, these data compare pretty much to most other metro areas with the exception of some of the, um, I will, I guess we'll call it more, uh, more Republican led states. So for example, uh, Dallas and Houston are both substantially higher return to office uh, compared to here, but you know, that's, there's some attitudinal things going on there as much as any, but generally these numbers are not that much different from most other areas, including places like Silicon Valley. Uh, New York is actually, I think, running a little bit lower than we are. So folks just aren't coming back and then when they're doing, you know, it's, it's, you know, maybe it's hybrid or, you know, some other kind of alternative like we're, we're experiencing. So my outlook then uh, we're going to, you know, it's about managing expectations. The story of, of, I'm sorry, I say that there, uh, the story of 2022, not 2021, uh, is inflation. What happens with the next uh, version is, do we, does the Omicron version really, are we at that peak now and coming off of it? And we're going to see hospitalizations and all return. And then, of course, we mentioned looming conflicts earlier Um and what might even be happening, of course, you know, as as China continues to flex its muscle in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we're not going to see ubiquity in vaccination until the fourth quarter. Um, you know, and do we have new variants emerge? I mean, we didn't know Omicron was going to show up. So I think it's all big uncertainty. But a lot of this is going to depend on businesses ability to adapt to these new market conditions like this. And some of it's going to be just like we've seen, we saw restaurants go out of business and we saw restaurants that were able to adapt to a new way of, of providing meals for their customers. And so, you know, I think it's business adaptation, talent and attraction are going to be key issues for us coming here, the work from home uh, that we do that. You know, is that a competitive advantage gained or is it one loss for us? I think much depends on what we do about the housing market, quite frankly, on all of that. Uh, the federal share of the regional economy, I think, will continue to grow slightly as the infrastructure spending starts to kick in and some of these other programs actually get fund, you know, get funded. Um, there is the possibility that, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what perspectives are coming about as we get into this uh, year. If we have a change, a substantial change in leadership in Congress, uh, then, you know, are we getting back to pure fiscal obstruction where you have a Democratic administration and Congress uh, being run by the Republicans? The 5G deployment creates some opportunities, but of course, now we got the whole thing with the airlines and all that stuff. So I think some of what we could have been seeing, you know, we talked about 5G last year in this session, and I think some of that deployment now that where we could start actually using it is being called into question in some parts of our markets. And then the funding. Um, I, I would be very surprised if our VC numbers look as strong as they did this year, this uh, or last year uh, in 2022. But I still think it's there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, for that. There's another sector I think that we need to talk about just for a moment about opportunities, and that's the nonprofit sector. Some of you may work for you know work with and and for nonprofit entities. There's a lot of money going into states and localities that could be directed and even directly go to nonprofits. But these nonprofits and a review that we did last summer um, so on just a set of some of them in our region would tell me that they are going to need help in finding that money and understanding federal rules of what you do with money, how you report it, the accounting you have to do. So I think there's going to be some real opportunity for some of you to, uh, to do some business there. Our outlook and issues then, economic recovery, the stock markets, um, well, stock markets, I think, are, are frothy. I think to a certain extent, housing has a potential to get there, not so much in our area, but I see it in some other areas. Uh, you see it in, and of course, does you have contagion effects. Uh, crypto, I'm still trying to figure that out because, you know, here, let me just ask this question to, as a rhetorical question, but if crypto is going to become the currency in the future, why would I spend 
35, 40, 45,000, whatever it is that Bitcoin is now, why not wait until the next producer where I can buy their coins for a dollar when they first issue? I mean, I, I don't get where that, where that model is going, except that I think people are bidding that up, not as a, not as buying a currency, but just as a speculative investment. And I can't help but think that there's going to be some people that are going to lose substantial money on those deals before it's set all said and done. We talked about inflation being elevated throughout the year. I think, you know, we'll be good. If we get 4%, that's going to be higher than they want. But I think that's, uh, I think that's what's going to shape up. Um, and the money's still going to be relatively cheap, uh, you know, by, um, by historical standards, just simply because the U.S. is a great place to park your money still. Uh, travel, leisure, hospitality in our region, I think we'll see leisure, leisure, uh, We'll see some additional recovery, assuming nothing bad happens with uh, with um, you know with the next variant. Uh, I think business travel is going to remain muted and is going to be a lot less contributor to regional growth and particularly the the uh, gross product of the District of Columbia. I think business travel is going to be be constrained throughout the year uh, and will be maybe years if ever before it goes back to what we were pre pandemic. Our talent, we've talked about that a little bit. Our ability to work from home. Here's one of the things that I think is a key success measure. Effectively, having a hybrid work model, unless you are providing face-to-face -face services to somebody, is the new norm and is going to be the new norm to be able to attract and retain workers. It was already happening before before we talked about that last year uh it was you know from it was perspective of just dealing with our con traffic congestion in this region so what does it really means it means that managers and supervisors are going to have to learn how to manage and supervise a somewhat remote workforce a hybrid location workforce where things that create water cooler innovation or collisions of innovation to use a former student of mine's term where you know those happenstance encounters are still happen but they are happening not as just organically as they might have of just walking into a building or walking down the hall but more of intentional gatherings and it's a management factor now the other one is of course is what are going to be the final rules out of the office of public management on what federal workers are able to do which will of course drive what happens with the contractors um Pennies from heaven is in downpour mode. Lots of money still coming out. And by the way, that is one of the, you know, that is contributing to inflation, but that's not all of it. If you try, you know, the political argument that Biden is responsible for all of inflation is a bunch of nonsense. And we all know that. Uh, the infrastructure, you know, we, we got this stuff and got this potential for us to really get infrastructure back up and competitive fixed bridges that, that have been needing to be fixed for a long time. We have underinvested in our basic infrastructure for decades now. We need to get up there, but I never underestimate how politics can screw up a good idea. Our bottom line, so again, just repeated what I said before, I won't go through it all again. Uh, our bottom line for the region, federal money is gonna be flowing. Contractors are gonna have lots of opportunities. Your biggest challenge is finding workers uh, to be able to put on contracts. And keep in mind that some of that is actually self-imposed challenges. And when I say self-imposed, it's that federal government where, you know, requiring that you have to have a bachelor's degree to, to do, you know, be on that contract. Why? And we still talk to employers that say, I don't care what certifications you have coming out of school, your degree and these stackable certs, it's do you have two years experience? We're going to have to figure out a way to get around that. Uh, the nonprofit opportunity is going to be there, but I think the build back better part is pretty much dead for, for this year and maybe for, for good. Uh, leisure travel, I said, the business travel constrained, we talked about that. Um, office consolidation or not, I think we're going to see a lot more office consolidation and the notion of converting offices to residential. We're seeing some demonstration projects on a couple of places. I think there's one near Clarence, a couple of them in Arlington and elsewhere. I think we're going to see that. I think it's we're going to see various types of, of real estate conversions. I can see Fair Oaks Mall, for example, becoming um, 
mixed juice where you have some distribution transportation you got to figure out how to get trucks in and out it's not going to be easy you know it's going to require some infrastructure investment uh, also we're seeing some places like in tyson's where they're they're changing up some all stuff and talking about adding instead of more retail space adding residential space I am very much in support of that. I think the whole thing about office to residential is interesting, and I don't want to take the time here, but we can certainly talk more about that in other sessions. I think it's, I, I when I got up here in this market, I'd say that's not going to happen. It doesn't pencil out. The, the, the structures are just too different. It's a design not right, but I think there might be ways of making it work now, and it could be a matter of desperation. Employment growth for this region, then my forecast is for an a, a, an uptick of about 75,000 jobs. So, you know, a pretty, pretty good boost, but not sure that, you know, it's certainly not going to get us back to the pre-pandemic um, timelines. Now, the last thing that I want to bring up, um, because I teach, I at least try to keep up a little bit with what's going on trends among our emerging workforce, our, our students. The TikTok generation, we'll call them, otherwise known as Gen Z, see themselves as the ones that matter. And they're probably right about that. Uh, baby boomers, here's the fact. We got to get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we barely understood Gen X. Uh, we were mostly just annoyed by millennials. And the Gen Z's might as well be from Alpha Centauri as far as we're concerned. Uh, the Gen Xers, of course, they resigned themselves to being irrelevant about 15 years ago. Uh, the millennials, to their great, great distress, are actually kind of now behaving like those, uh, those uh, insurance ads where it's the you become your parent when you buy a house. And so they're, they're very much distressed about seeing themselves starting to act like their parents. And it's really kind of interesting. I heard an interview the other day with a Gen Zer being interviewed by a millennial and you could almost hear that stuff that we used to get from the millennials, you know, the disdain in the voice kind of thing. The thing is, is that what we have to do is just understand that the structure of our employment has probably been changed forever and that we need to think about just different ways of engaging and enacting our workforce. And if we don't do that, then that employment growth of 75,000 isn't gonna happen. And with that, uh, Cindy, let's go ahead and move into the questions. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Clower. Um, we've set aside around 10 minutes to answer your questions and we have quite a few. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, the first one is related to childcare. Early in the presentation, you spoke to, to childcare being a national economic issue and one that has been present for many years. We know that the labor market has been impacted by women exiting the workforce and in many cases directly tied to this issue of childcare. Can you speak to this topic and what you would foresee as being a solution to increase the trend of women returning to work? Is there any indication through trends analysis of this improving locally? There are, well, under the current, and, and things are not going to get better until we get a handle on COVID. But, you know, and, the, and the, but the problem that we have here is it's like a, one of my colleagues who's an epidemiologist that I did some work with early in, in this, you know, said that it, who she's a, a COVID expert. But remember that COVID is a generalized class, but it's also the same kind of virus that causes the common cold. And last time I checked, we didn't have a cure for the common cold. So, you know, we may be living with this in the long run and so variations on this. I think what we're going to have to figure out, I think it's going to be, I remember that there was experiments in the 1990s companies early 1990s where companies were actually starting to make childcare a part of a benefit to where you know it actually within your building you would have child care services and of course the lawyers got a hold of that and, and stopped it all right because the liabilities were too great i think we got to figure out a way of public policy having a reasonable restriction on liability for the businesses to start looking at that. And maybe that becomes something that you use some of that extra space for as your workers are coming in and out. But it's gonna, it, I don't think the answer to this is simply having government fund childcare. Oh, because one of the other things we have is that childcare workers are among our most low paid people in our society. So I think we need to address this from several perspectives. But quite honestly, I think that by the time Congress a narrowly divided Congress gets done arguing with each other and posturing and, and going to their extreme bases, 
that it will be the private sector that's going to have to figure this out and even maybe community solutions and and local government as opposed to national government having to come up with innovative ways of dealing with this by the way if i come up with that idea and it is the idea i'm going on the talk show circuit and it will be really expensive to listen to me then <laughs> okay um now we're going to move more to the real estate side. Um, towards the end of your presentation, you were you kind of addressed the mixed use properties. Um, we have a question specific to mixed use developments and whether or not you see any hot spots in the DC area. I know you mentioned Tyson's and possibly Fair Oaks Mall. Are there any others? Well, certainly in, in our region, now that we have we're, we're closer to the promise of a silver line to Dulles. We're not there yet. Uh, the, you know, they, it's like that carrot, you know, with the, with the donkey, right? It just a little bit, we're, we're, we can smell it, but we're not quite there yet. But, but I, I think that we will continue to see along the silver line, those TOD developments, and we will see new investments in more dense um, the developments around transit stations. Here's the interesting thing uh, that we got to know. We're going to have to come up with a different way of funding WMATA so that we have an effective trans transit system in this region. But in the short term, they are in a world of hurt because if you think about it, if you have most of your professional workers riding transit rail, which is what happens there, uh, people that are working in the restaurants are riding the bus. It's an interesting a dichotomy almost in their ridership but if they if you don't go to the office one day a week that's 20 percent of revenue all right so they are going to be in a real revenue bind but they're going to have to keep the services and more and more is going to have to be about providing transportation services for non-commuting trips grocery stores whatever it is and so we're going to have to rethink how we fund that oh by the way and just so you'll know in five to seven years, do not be surprised if you're paying a user fee to use the highways because the gas tax ain't gonna work. Any, it doesn't work now and it's certainly not gonna work in the future. Uh, but having said all that, I think that any number of transit zones, although you know you have circumstances because Prince George's County has not received the kind of investment that other counties have had around their transit stations. But for us in Northern Virginia uh, and in the district and then, more Montgomery County, I think that we will see um, we will see densification over the years. In the short term, I think even in the extent that some of the you're you're not going to convert an office building into residential that is not really really close to transit. Okay, very interesting. Um, also, in regards to real estate, um, we have a participant asking um, with real wages forecasted to decline and mortgage rates forecasted to increase, why is it that you expect the housing market to remain strong? Pent up demand and there's still enough people that are on the sidelines, not because of affordability, but because of availability of homes. So there, there's, there is enough pent up demand there. And, and keeping in mind that even though the uh, mortgage rates might go up, it, it's not it, if you are so tight on your budget for affording a home that you can afford one at 3.1%, but you can't afford one at 3.8%, I might argue to you that you're probably not ready for home ownership, <laughs> uh, you know, financially. It, it's that, if you're that on the edge. Uh, the other piece is, of course, that that increase in the uh, amount that qualifies for a conforming loan will help our market. Uh, you know, that, that will actually help some people that will want to, that were wanting to move up that will see obviously a much better loan rate because they were looking at jumbo loans before. But I think that, that we will see continued strength and it's because of pent up demand. Okay. Um, moving on to labor shortages and supply chain issues that you uh, previously discussed, uh, you had mentioned places such as McDonald's, um, putting kiosks in their locations to reduce the number of employees they actually need. Um, do you see any other industries uh, leveraging technology um, in the future and what some of those ideas might be? 
well, we're already seeing a little bit. How many of us use the self-checkout at the grocery store now versus using the clerk? So any, you know, retail, all of those sectors, I think we're going to see more and more. I think the nature of retail is going to change fundamentally because we're going to find out which particular goods do we actually need to see, feel, and try on to buy. Otherwise, it's not going to be in the store, it's going to be online. And you think about how that could shrink your footprint for a retail store, right? Uh, to where you only have those kind of goods available. So I think we'll see more of that shifting in. Um, certainly transportation, I think there are some elements, but the one that I mentioned that's the biggest is going to be where AI and machine learning start taking on clerical processes and how that reshapes our employment demand within our white collar workforce. That's the real change. We'll also see it in blue collar, but that doesn't Im impact our additive manufacturing, uh, robotics and things like that will continue to be ad adopted by forward looking firms in manufacturing, but that's just not a big sector for us. Um, and in, even with that, a very automated place like Micron, they're look they've got demand for hundreds of workers at the moment. Okay. And I think we have enough time for maybe one more question. Um, how long do you expect the disparity between the 10-year treasury bond rate and inflation uh, to last? So the presumption here is that inflation's running hot at, you know, five and six percent now, and treasuries are still in the 1.7, I think something like that kind of range, if you will. Um, I don't, I expect that that's going to be at least through 2022 and probably into 2023, even as we see rate increases, there's going to be a, a gap. It's going to narrow somewhat, but it's, it's going to be a gap. And so that means, what that really means is that if you're parking your money in safe places like bonds, you're doing so at a loss. But that's been true for several years now. Um, I know you may have some additional questions. We um, want to thank Dr. Clower uh, for today's presentation. If you have additional questions um, or any items that you would like to discuss with Dr. Clower, uh, we would like to invite you to now turn on your camera for an interactive networking session.